You are listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. This episode is made possible by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 areas of academic study. Today's guest is Dr. Blake Brown, the director of the University of Tennessee Research and Education Center in Milan. This is Scott Williams, your host of Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where every single week we talk about the history, the people, and the culture of our home right here in West Tennessee. As you know, we're opening up an ag exhibit in December, and we have a very special guest today that knows all about ag and has been very helpful in working with us a little bit on this exhibit. We have Blake Brown, who is the director of the University of Tennessee's Agriculture Research and Education Center in Milan, Tennessee. Welcome, Blake. Thank you. Good morning. How you doing? Fantastic. And and I can see by your background there that you are you are right there in the fields. The sun's coming up over the corn. Um, yeah. I think that corn on your background is a little fresher than what I'm seeing in the fields here. Green, it is. That's right. <laughs> well, we're almost finished with harvest around here. But I'm yeah, talking. yeah, this was taken a few years ago, and just. Well, I'm I'm honestly I'm glad that the um, corn is being harvested because I ride my bike here around um, O'Brien County, and it's kind of hard to go around those corners when the corn is up that tall. You have to pay attention. That's yeah. sure um, so tell me a little bit about you. I, we've we've met a few times, but I don't know where'd you come from and how did you end up in the ag biz. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was actually born in Knoxville. My parents are both from from Knoxville. My uh, they met at UT up there, I guess, many years ago. And uh, my dad was grew up on a, a farm in West Knox County, uh, just a little small, uh, I think it was 36 acres, and they had beef cattle and grew tobacco and, and, and truck crops. You know, they had tomatoes and cucumbers and okra and squash and all that kind of stuff. And I can remember as a kid, you know, going up there and picking the stuff and packing it on a truck and just the old pickup and hauling it to the farmer's market in Knoxville. And we thought it was forever to get to Knoxville. When I was in school up there, I mean, it was 15 minutes away. But as a child, you know, riding in the back of that truck on top of a, a, a basket full of cantaloupes or whatever, that's just the way we did. And it seemed like a long way off going to the big city. But, you know, so I guess I've been around ag all my life. Uh, when I was three weeks old, my dad took a job with UT in Jackson at the West Tennessee Experiment Station. He was actually a horticulture researcher. And so we moved down here uh, when I was three weeks old. And so I guess uh, my, one of my other grandmothers used to call me a flatland hillbilly. She was from Crockett <laughs> originally, but was born in Knoxville and, and spent all his life in West Tennessee. So, um, you know, like I said, my dad worked out there at the Experiment Station in Jackson. And, and some of my earliest memories were going to work with him and, you know, he worked with all kind of vegetable and fruit crops. And um, and then he, on the side, he had greenhouses. And so I grew up working in greenhouses when I was in junior high and high school. And I didn't have the love for that that he did. He loved it. Uh, it was just a job to me, hard work, long hours, lots of hand work. Uh, but it, it, it did a lot of good. It allowed me to go to school. And uh, so anyway, fast forward uh Got ready to go to college and was looking at UT Martin, um, but I was kind of thinking about going into ag engineering at the time. Uh, and at that time, this has been back in 1982, uh, UT Martin did not have an engineering program. So I could have started and gone two years, then I was going to have to go to Knoxville. So I just decided I'd go to Knoxville. And I did, and uh, engineering was not suited for me, uh, nor me for it. We didn't get along very well. Um, I stayed in it almost two years and ended up switching majors to plant and soil science, which was what my dad was in. And I remember he had he had told me he wouldn't I, I couldn't change majors for two years, and I was miserable. I really I just my mind doesn't work that way. And I, I went and changed majors and then called him. And I remember he said, "Well, he said the only advice I can give you." He said, "If you're gonna." If you're going to switch to plant and soil science, he said, you just well plan on getting a PhD. 
And I said, well, Doc, he got his back in 1977, went back and got it. And I said, well, the way I'm going, the best I can figure, I said, I can get a PhD in plant and soil science before I'm ever going to get a BS in ag engineering. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize how true that was. Had no intention of getting one. No intention. But anyway, uh, finished up, got a, got a BS in plant and soil science from UT Knoxville. Uh, along the way, I had had an opportunity to do an internship with, with DuPont Ag Products. And they had a guy that I had known. His mother was my teacher when I was in the fifth grade, and she had gone out on a, uh, I think she had surgery and had to, to be out for six weeks. And he substituted for us, and we had a big time with him. But he went on and got his doctorate and came back and went to work for, for DuPont. And anyway, he hired me as an intern. And we did work with some, we did a lot of development work with herbicides primarily. And uh, I had I had started working at the UT Milan Center here when I was 16. So I'd worked there for six summers before this internship. Just, I mean, I was a hoe hand. I was a gopher. Uh, I did all the, a lot of mowing. I did a lot of weed pulling, uh, just, you know, but I loved it. I mean, I loved what I was doing. But anyway, when I worked with, with DuPont, they had some new products coming along that were uh, allowing us to uh, to spray weeds and kill things we'd never been able to do before. For instance, the big one was controlling Johnson grass and corn. Well, controlling a grass crop or grass weed in a grass crop was just a miracle. And they had some new products, and I ended up ultimately doing my master's thesis on that. And uh, But I just got intrigued with that, and I thought, you know, I, I, this is fun. This is cool. We're seeing new stuff coming out of the, uh, the labs in, in Delaware. Uh, we're getting to try it in the field and see what it does. And, uh, you know, I thought that's what I want to do. And so went directly into a master's program with Dr. Bob Hayes. He, he was the weed scientist located down at Jackson. In fact, Dr. Hayes went on to become the, the director at Jackson after my dad retired. Uh, and he just retired last week. Oh. No, uh, but he was a mentor and allowed me to come along and, um, finished that. You know, I was ready to go to work, weren't any jobs. Um, like I said, the last thing on my mind was working on a doctorate. I just, I wasn't crazy about school. It was a means to an end for me. But uh, got a chance to go to Mississippi State and start on that PhD. And uh, just a, oh, a few weeks before I left, six or eight weeks, they called and they said, right, we got bad news. The money for your assistantship was falling through. Um, we don't have any funding for you, but we have another professor who has uh, has a position in turf weed control. Well, I didn't know anything about turf, uh, but I, you know, I was kind of stuck. And I thought, let's try it and see. So I went down there and uh, I started working in the turf business. I knew nothing about it. Turf is a whole other side of agriculture. Uh, there's a whole, you know, between athletic fields and uh, uh, golf courses and just all, you know, commercial turf. It's a big, big, big business. That I need yeah, to Discovery Park of America, we have a lot of turf here. I'm sure you do. So, you know, uh, and there's a lot of people going into it, a, a great a great industry. Uh, but anyway, ultimately, that wasn't my calling. Uh, I, I can remember working out in the turf plots and seeing the guys go to the field to harvest the corn and the beans and the cotton and just feeling kind of sick. <laughs> and I, I ended up coming back to Tennessee and, and working back in ag agronomic weed control and ended up getting a, a doctorate at UT. And so, uh, and then I got the opportunity for my dream job. Uh, I got a job working with DuPont and they said, you're going to be, a, actually, it's going to be a sales rep in Lincoln, Nebraska. Never been to Nebraska, never spent any time in the Midwest to speak of. It was January. Um, about uh, a couple of days before I was to move, I got a call and they said, hey, our, our development rep is retiring. Would you be interested in that job? Well, that's what I wanted to begin with. Absolutely. So I fly to Omaha, uh, met with my guy that hired me, then met with my new boss, and, and I started off on the job doing field development work in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I worked in Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota a little bit, uh, and loved it. Just loved it. I worked out of my house. 
Uh, it's interesting. We had uh, my wife and I got married while I was in, working on my doctorate, and she was a teacher. And we thought, well, we'll get her a job in Knoxville, and move her to Knoxville, and blah blah blah. Well, guess what? That didn't work out. So she taught school in Jackson for two years while I was in Knoxville. The first two years we were married, and uh, we went from that to me working out of the house. Uh, people said, y'all never make it, you know, you're going to get together. And, and we hit 30 years back in June. So I, I think we're going to make it. But, uh, but anyway, spent, spent five years there. I really did love it. And, uh, got a call one day as, as I mentioned, I had started working at Milan here when I was 16, worked six summers. I worked here while I was in graduate school. So, uh, from 1980 until 90, golly. 93, I was here every summer in 92. Uh, then I get a call and said, hey, the uh, the superintendent's job is opened up in Milan. You interested? <laughs> nope. Like what I'm doing. Long story short, we uh, we wound up here. And the end of this month will be 23 years. So wow, that's kind of how I got here. That's a long story. but uh, That's great. Congratulations. No, through the, uh, through the, the years, I've sort of had an opportunity to play around in different areas of agriculture, you know, going back, I used to go help my grandparents before I started working. Uh, you know, we'd go cut tobacco and food with, with cows and, and, and pick veggies. That wasn't my favorite thing, but, uh, you know, I had a chance to work in turf. I, I worked in row crops. I worked in the Midwest. So, I, I you know, I've had some, some pretty neat opportunities, I think. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a really special place there um, at the center in Milan. Can you tell us a little bit about the history, how it came to be, and a little bit about Tom McCutcheon? Sure can. Uh, in fact, I've got a, a letter on the other side of my desk here that my wife found uh, several years ago where Tom offered me a job in 1980 to work here. So I went to work for him. Uh, but, yeah, the center was established in 1962. And it was on lands that had been declared excess from the Milan Army Ammunition Plant, the Milan Arsenal, many people know of it uh, as. Of course, the Arsenal was established back in the 40s to support the, the war effort, and uh, they took in 20 something thousand acres. I think it may have been more than it is right now. At various times, they excess some of that property. And so in 62, we got. Uh, almost 500 acres of land to establish an ag experiment station here. Now, the university system currently has 10 ag research centers across the state, and we are one of them. Since that time, uh, we have leased additional land from the Army, uh, the first back in the early 80s, and then again in 2002, I believe, we picked up another, another parcel. So in addition to the almost 500 that we own, we lease 388 acres from them right now. And uh, they have been great landlords. Um, you know, about 60% of our tillable acres are now on the arsenal property that we lease, which brings up something I probably should mention is that uh, this facility is in the process of closing down now. And we're making an effort to try to get the land that we have been leasing transferred to the university so that we can continue on <clears throat> using this property for ag research. <clears throat> and uh, it's a long, drawn-out process working with the Army. Uh, and so we're working with our legislators and trying to get things done that way. And we actually are asking for support from the public. Uh, and if people are interested in, in helping us there, there's a site they can go to and just express their support. And if you don't mind, I'll just mention that. It's, it's advocacy.tennessee.edu slash Milan. Uh, and you just go in there and you put your name and it just pops up a, a letter that will go to all the, the, the legislators in the state. So, you know, we're hopeful that, that we're going to be able to get that done so that we can continue this operation here. Uh, but that's a little sidebar, but it's a very important one because if we don't make this happen, we're going to lose more than half of our property here. And that's, I think that'd be unfortunate. So, yeah, we'll put a, we'll put a link to that in the body of this podcast so people can click on it and go there. So anyway, back to the, the history, uh, you know, Tom came in and Tom McCutcheon was the first director here. Uh, they called them superintendents back then. 
And, you know, the goal here at Milan, <clears throat> of course, we had a station at Jackson just south of us, 25 miles, where most of the, the faculty were located. But here at Milan, it was originally called the Milan Field Station. And the thinking was, uh, you got a few more acres here. We might be able to do larger plots, do field scale experiments, et cetera, uh, and just more resources for the faculty to use. And so it started. Uh, and then along the way, <clears throat> Tom noticed that uh, we had a lot of erosion going on here in West Tennessee. And Milan was right in the heart of it. And he just recognized the fact that we could not keep farming the way he, we had done for hundreds of years, plowing this soil, working it to death, planting, watching it wash off in the during the growing season. And, you know, we'd have to plow in the ruts in the fall so we could harvest and plow in the ruts in the spring so we could plant. And he thought we've got to do something different. And he started playing with this concept that we now know is no-till. Uh, and he assembled a team of people, you know, to work on various aspects because there were two main issues. You know, if you're not going to till that soil so that you can plant the seed, you got to figure out how do I get that seed into that old hard dirt that's out there. Uh, you get into June, you know, you're planting late soybeans and it's 100 degrees. It's, it bakes it. It's just like a rock. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so that was the first issue. How do we get a planter that will plant that? Second issue, you know, tillage has been used since the beginning of agriculture as for weed control. Uh, you know, we can go back to the Bible and, you know, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. You know, uh, oh, weed scientists told me that one time. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's there and it's true. And, uh, you know, if you don't have that option to till, what are you going to do? Well, we're going back in the 60s and 70s. We didn't have a lot of herbicide options back then. So, again, there were a team of folks assembled. Uh, how can we do this? And they started working on this pro process. And, hey, it wasn't early. Uh, I can even remember when I came along in 1980, some of the stuff they were doing then was just, compared to what we do now, was just, wow, you'd think, hmm, can't believe we were doing it that way. But they had made a lot of progress by then. We were successfully no-tilling crops by the early 80s. And so in 1981, they decided to have a field day to teach the farmers how to do this new concept that we call no-till. And the farmers, as I understand it, were very resistant. They even called it like dirty farming. It wasn't, it wasn't farming, popular. Dirty farming, yeah. It, it, just, it wasn't what they were used to. Uh, you know, I mean, farmers like to till ground. You know, we call it recreational tillage. Some people call it therapy. I mean, you get on a tractor and got a disc, it's kind of fun to sit there and watch that dirt turn. And to have to just stop doing that, uh, it was a big change. And a lot of people thought it wouldn't work. They thought the, the insects are going to cover it up. The diseases will be terrible. You know, all these bad things are going to happen. And with a lot of work, and a lot of research, we found that wasn't the case. But I've seen I've seen pictures of the erosion that was taking place back then with gullies that I could stand in that were so deep. I mean, it was destroying the area. It was, and, and I remember seeing those. I mean, as a kid, that was just pretty typical. Uh, you know, a couple of things that stand out. You probably seen the old fence rows. You know, where they didn't plow, the fence row was three feet taller than the field beside it because it didn't wash away because it wasn't disturbed. Cemeteries are another one. You know, where they're not disturbed, a lot of times they'll be higher, but. Mm -hmm. It was obvious that, uh, that, I mean, we were losing it. And the other thing that I didn't know till I, I got in college and took some soils classes, but West Tennessee is, uh, our part of West Tennessee is, is known as the coastal plain. Uh, eons ago when all this was formed, uh, they claimed that this was a beach. You know, we were, we were actually an ocean. And, and if you've ever watched them drill a well or something, you get down below the, the topsoil layer, you know, what do you get? White sand. I mean, it looks just like a beach, and it goes for some places hundreds of feet down. And so this wind-blown silt was blown in on top of this sand, and that's what we farm now. And the, the dilemma is if we lose that layer of silt, you're down to sand, things don't grow well in sand uh, unless you've got lots and lots and lots of water. And so if we lose this topsoil, we basically we're back to a desert. And so anyway... Uh, lots of people involved, lots of effort, and they started <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> perfecting. <clears throat> excuse me, perfecting this system. Started the field day in 1981, and about 1,800 people showed up, and that was just unheard of. Uh, we had never had an event like that, 
And so they decided, well, this went over pretty well. Maybe we ought to do it again. And so did it again in 1982, and the crowd just got bigger. And so it became a tradition. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, at its heyday in the mid-'90s, uh, there were close to 10,000 people uh, in one year. Uh, when I came here in 97, we were at about 8,000. And, and most recently, we're running, you know, 2,500 or so. But, uh, you know, this was the 40th year for the no-till field day. Uh, we didn't get to do it live this year because of the COVID, so we had to go virtual. And we had, uh, oh, as of a month ago or so, we had had over 50,000 hits on that site with people from 38 different countries, which amazed me. Uh, so people are still interested in it. Uh, you know, some people say, well, why did, the, why did it go down? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. Number one, it's not new. Uh, this year in Tennessee, 96% of our acres across the state were farmed with some form of conservation tillage. Uh, about 80% is true no-till and another 16% or so is, is some form that leaves at least 30% of the surface covered with residue. So only 4% is farmed with the old system like we used to do. So, you know, there's not the, uh, the, the drive to learn how to do it. Uh, I think secondly, there's not near as many farmers as there were back 30, 40 years ago. You know, they've consolidated, they've gotten bigger. Uh, we're probably still getting the acres represented that we had back then, but it's just less people involved. So it's been a, that's been one of our uh, claims to fame is that, you know, that system that was, you can argue there's people in Western Kentucky that say it started in Kentucky and we say hey, it started here. Who knows? It doesn't matter. Uh, we worked together and it, and it happened and we got our people to adopt it. And ultimately <clears throat> we're saving lots of topsoil from, from going down the Mississippi river and, and winding up in the Delta of New Orleans. So that but Tom, that Tom never got to actually uh, see that come to fruition, right? He passed away before it was universally accepted, as I understand. That's true. Tom passed away in 1982, I believe. Um, he, he got cancer, and he was in his early 50s and just didn't last very long, and he, he did not get to see what it has come to today. Uh, of course, Speaking of Tom, one of his other hobbies was collecting old antique farm equipment, and he had collected stuff all over West Tennessee. And, and when he passed away, there were a couple of chicken houses up here in the edge of Carroll County that were just crammed full of all of his finds. And so the community got behind, and they built the West Tennessee Ag Museum that's located here. And uh, his daughter came through three or four years ago. We were doing a renovation at the museum, and we got a little video. And, I remember her saying that her and her mother, who, who served as a secretary here at this operation, uh, they said so they just called it stuff. That's just dad's stuff, you know. But he he recognized that, you know, we need to preserve that history of West Tennessee. And, and he worked to do that. And Mr. Bob Parkins was the newspaper editor here in Milan. He and Tom were big buddies and were in the Rotary Club together. And, and Bob was kind of the push behind getting the Museum Association uh, established and, and getting that facility built and so it's it's kind of a unique treasure for us and and for west tennessee right here i know y'all been down here and we've, we've talked about doing some sharing and swapping and what have you but uh you know that all goes back to tom and uh, he was he was a visionary and i don't know if he even realized that but he really yeah. was I think a lot of people don't even really realize what's there in that museum and how fascinating it is. And it's, it's free, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, we're, we're still closed because of the COVID we're taking, you know, we take direction out of UT Knoxville and I hope that will change it at some time in the near future, but we've actually gotten some new, uh, new items just here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, our friends up at Alliance application there in, uh, Troy, I guess, they, they brought us an old spray coop sprayer that had been fully restored. One of the first ones I've ever seen, earliest ones. And it's kind of neat. We got it in there. I think it'd been y'all's place, actually. Well, you you uh, you talked about uh, how you guys did the no the uh, no till field day digitally, and I watched that. It was really interesting because you got to almost sit in the cab of your truck and get a tour of places that you don't normally get to see. That was cool. But you guys also have a really thorough tour of the museum that you can watch online that I think is really, really well done and fascinating. Yeah, we did. Uh, you know, when we started thinking about going virtual and that was just, uh, I mean, that was an idea. Our, our uh, 
executive vice president, Dr. Tim Cross, he was having fireside chats. He started back in March and it was actually the first one. And he was just saying that, you know, we're going to have to think about new ways of doing things. And I'd already been thinking a little, how are we going to do this field day if, if this stuff continues on? Again, this is March. We didn't really know what we were dealing with. And I didn't know that we were going to have to make a decision pretty quickly because we have to order lots of tents and stuff. And it doesn't all happen in the fourth Thursday in July. There's a lot, a lot of prep work before. And I just thought, you know, I had four thoughts I wrote down during his talk. And one was we could do tours and record them. Uh, we, we've always had the museum open and we could do a virtual tour of the, of the museum. Uh, we could do a virtual tour of the station because we have an overview tour. And then we have a trade show and thought, you know, we could put that out for exhibitors to, to submit videos. And, and ultimately, that's what we did. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we had a, a young lady who has worked with us for about 12 years, Ginger Rousey. And I called, she was, when I first met with the folks in my office here to see what their thoughts were, and they said, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Then we called Ginger. And as it turned out, Ginger spent a lot of time making that happen, and we couldn't have done it without her. And unfortunately, she did such a great job that the uh, Delta Farm Press hired her away from us just recently, and we, we miss her terribly. But uh, she was very instrumental in making that happen. Uh, Charles Denny was another of her colleagues in Knoxville, and the whole marketing and communications staff. Uh, it, it was a team effort from a lot of people. Uh, Leslie Smelser here in our office was very instrumental. My, my crew, they, they carried on with our research program because I was kind of tied up doing the field day this past year, but uh, you know, all the faculty doing the, the presentations, I think we ended up having 65 different talks. And so it was pretty extensive. We had 16 different research tours. I had the museum tour, had the overview tour. So yeah, it was a lot of stuff, but I think it went well. And uh, you know, we, we did not know what we were doing when we started. I, I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, we had this. We had to, we had to work through it, but uh, I was pretty pleased with, with the final product. Yeah, it's fascinating to have that up there so that anybody who wants to learn, if they can't get to Milan, um, one thing that stands in my, that just pops in my head is the example that you were able to show of a field that had not been tilled in over 40 years. And so you dig in and there's earthworms. Yeah, we call that the earthworm field. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, yes, over 40 years. And unless it's just really bone dry in the middle of July, I, I will bet you pretty good money. I can go out there and stick a shovel in the ground, turn up an earthworm. And we've had US or NRCS people did some studies on that several years ago and compared that to a conventional teal field to a, a field over in the woods. And I forget the exact numbers, but it was like 90 earthworms per cubic foot in that earthworm field versus virtually none in the conventional teal field and a few in the, in the woods. And so uh, you look at that, of course, the earthworms, they, they form channels through that. Well, guess what? If you got those channels, when it rains, there's, places for the water to go into the soil. So it increases the the uh, infiltration into the soil. Well, if guess what? If it runs into the soil, it doesn't run off. If it doesn't run off, it doesn't carry soil with it. So that is a big part of reducing erosion. So like all the things we do, it's a system. Uh, systems are complex. Uh, nothing is as easy as it seems. And uh, But yeah, that's a great example. Um, what what are some of the misconceptions that regular folks that don't know where their food, fuel, and fiber really comes from? You've been in agriculture your whole life. What are some of the things you hear or see or things you think that's not right? What are some mis you know set straight for us some of the misperceptions? You know we we talk we don't do a good enough job of telling our story, and I guess that's one reason you know this is sort of out of my comfort jump zone, but. I try to take any opportunity I can to talk about what we do. Uh, I think number one, people, they don't have to worry where their food comes from, their clothes, their fuel, you know, we're involved in all those now. And so if they're not having to worry about it, they're really not too concerned about how that happens. And, and we would like for people to recognize that, Hey, that takes a person that has made an investment that is working all year to make that happen so that you have food on your table, clothes on your back, fuel in your car. Um, and 
without somebody doing that, you know, it's not going to happen. You know, I believe that food is a national security issue. Um, we have been blessed in this country that we've always had plenty as opposed to other places in the world. We take it for granted. I'm guilty just like everybody else is, but I think we need this. Uh, you know, I have a great admiration for our farmers. Uh, at one time in my life, that's what I thought I would like to do. Uh, probably fortunately for me, it didn't work out that way because there's certain skills that they need to have that I don't have. You know, I'm not a mechanic. The farmer needs to be a mechanic amongst a lot of other things. Uh, you know, they have to be an agronomist. They have to be an, a, a mechanic. They have to be a veterinarian. They have to be a business person. They have to market their, their crops or their livestock. I mean, on and on and on. And they need to be really good at most of those or find somebody to help them that's not. And, uh, you know, I, I, I figured out a way to work in the business uh, without having to actually, you know, take those risks. And they take huge risks. And I have been fortunate, I guess, in this job. You know, we, we produce crops. Part of my job is to market those crops and sell them. And what we make goes back into our budget to support the research. So I pay attention. I'm not an expert. Uh, but I want to make as much as I can because that allows us to buy more equipment, upgrade things, and, and do the things we need to do to support the research effort. So it's really, uh, it's one thing to sit there on paper. You know, I got a report this morning. I said somebody was looking to, uh, for some people to sell cotton equities at 10 and a half cents. Well, that's 10 and a half cents on top of the 52 cents you get from going into government loan. Yeah, that's better than it's been. Um, you know, deciding to pull that trigger when it's real money is it's not as easy as doing it on paper. And so I, I have developed a great appreciation for the ones that can, you know, figure their costs, know when they can make a little money. The dilemma is what if the price never gets to your cost of production? What do you do? And they, they deal with that a lot of times. You know, if you sell knowing you're losing money, it's hard. And uh, some years, the price never gets to your, your, your cost. Uh, I guess the other thing I've said about to folks is, you know, in my 23 years here, uh, if you take a 10-year period, I'm going to say one or two years, farmers are going to make pretty good money. Uh, one or two years, they're going to almost go broke. And, and the other six or seven years are just kind of going to cruise in there, kind of at the break, even hang in there another year. And, uh, you know, can you imagine working all year for nothing? And they do that a lot of times, and that's tough. So, you know, another long answer to a quick question, but I think we need to appreciate the ones that are doing that, making the investment. Um, sometimes it looks like they're doing really well. You know, this equipment's expensive, it's shiny and pretty, but uh, there's a there's a huge cost that goes along with that. Uh, I think, you know, food safety is huge. Uh, we are fortunate in this country. We've got a very strict system that, you know, with all the people we have, yeah, we have issues crop up periodically, but it's pretty minor. Um, we have the safest supply of food, the most abundant of anywhere in the world and the cheapest. And we just, we don't, we don't recognize that. Um, there is a place for organics. There's a place for all these others. Uh, I don't think they will ever feed the masses. Um, and I think we got to consider that, uh, the whole labeling issue is something that, you know, things are being marketed that eh, probably don't mean as much as they want you to think. Um, so, you know, there's lots of issues going on, but, uh, I just think people need to recognize that we're very blessed in this country with the system that we have and we do a great job. You know, the, the pesticide issue, you know, I, I worked in that industry you know, I, I learned early on there is a huge safety margin built in for all chemicals that are sprayed in this country. Uh, farmers don't want to spray any more than they have to because it costs money. Uh, the things we're using now are hundreds of times safer than what we used 30, 40, 50 years ago. And there is a built-in safety factor of 100x plus of any, any effect that would cause to some organism. And so, you know, uh, my kids were little and you know, when I was in that business and, and I never think twice about, you know, what am I feeding them? Am I, am I going to cause them damage? They're grown now and they're just fine. But uh, people don't understand that built-in safety margin. 
When you talked a little bit, a lot of what you've talked about has to do with innovation. And I know out there at Milan, you guys are doing a lot of experimenting and a lot, there's a lot of innovation going on. What are some of the, some of the projects you guys have right now? Yeah, we, you know, we, we, I talked about people don't come here as much to learn how to no-till, but, but my thinking is we're trying to incorporate all the new technologies into a no-till system because that's what our farmers in this state are doing. They're already no till So, I mean, you know, okay, I'm a weed scientist. You know, this whole herbicide tolerance and, and weed resistance issues, and we have had some true challenges uh, back in the, oh, I forget, late 90s, maybe the, uh, the first case of mare's tail or horseweed resistance to Roundup was discovered in Delaware. The second place it was discovered in the U.S. was at the Milan Experiment Station. Uh, within a year or two, that just was all over West Tennessee and pretty soon all over the Southeast. And we had to learn how do we manage that? Uh, then another one came along that was called Palmer Pigweed. It made Mare's Tail look like Sunday school. I mean, no big deal. And it was awful. It had been down in Georgia and Mississippi and I saw fields that were actually dissed up. They just didn't even harvest them. It was so bad. So we've had to learn how to manage these. And it, you know, you get something like that pop up, it takes three or four or five years to find some some tools that'll work. Uh, so lots of effort going on with that, lots of effort with, with insect control, disease control, that constantly changes. Uh, we, we, we fix one problem or find a cure for it or a way to manage it and another one pops up. Uh, you know, when I first came up here, boll weevil eradication was a big program in cotton because boll weevils had been uh, working us over for a hundred years. And we got that one kind of under control. Well, all of a sudden, stink bugs start showing up. Stink bugs have never been a big problem in cotton. Um, but when you control one pest, another one's going to take its place. Uh, you know, we're doing work with a lot of irrigation systems that have gone in the state in the last 15 years. We have three systems here, and two of them are outfitted with what's called a variable rate irrigation system. And so... A tower is about, between the wheels, is about 180 feet on our, our pivots. Uh, those are split in half to form a zone, and the zone will be two degrees of travel as that pivot makes that windshield swipe. So out on the end of the pivot, a zone will be about 30 or 40 feet wide and about 90 feet long. And so within each one of those zones and under those pivots, we'll have over a 1,000 zones. With variable rate, we can put anywhere from zero to 100% of our application rate. So if we're putting out a half inch of water, we can put from half down to zero or anywhere in between on each one of those zones that we pick mm -hmm. out. So that allows us to do a lot of work um, with when do we start watering uh, a crop? When do we stop? I saw a new publication came out just this week on soybeans and, and evaluating do we start when they begin bloom or when they begin making pods? It makes a difference. Of course, that's all tied to the weather. This year, we had pretty good rainfall on our corn and cotton. Uh, and corn this year, actually, the irrigated yields are less than the, the dryland yields, just because we probably got too much water where we irrigated. And so you're always, uh, you know, you never know. You, you do the best you can do. But uh, let me carry on. We're, we're working with, with drones, you know, looking at drones to fly over these crops. And, you know, can we detect diseases or other things? Uh, we're working with fertilities and new sources of, of fertilizers. Or how do you place them? When do you put them out? Uh, a lot of the stuff we're doing, they were doing 40 years ago. But as new technologies come along, we keep evaluating. And our goal is ultimately, uh, you know, we've got to produce more with less. Uh, we're losing farmland every day. Uh, you know, we're building subdivisions and and big box stores and highways, and every time one of those goes in, that land is gone forever. And so we've got more people, our population's going up, our land's going down. We got to do more with less. You ever heard that before, Scott? Sure you have. We all do. Yeah. And the, uh, the uh, little apple um, educational tool is really, has a lot of visual impact when we share it with uh, young folks here. It does, and that's a that's a neat thing that I ran across several years ago, and I do it a lot. And I'm glad you brought that up because ultimately, uh, you know, we got this big old wide world, and we think West Tennessee is full of farmland, and we'll have enough forever. And the reality is, it's getting less and less every day. And, and the reality is, the bulk of our food production is on a very uh, 
a small percentage of the earth. And then even if you look at that and peel that peel off that apple, it's really tied to that top six or eight or ten inches of soil. Uh, and if we lose that, uh, we're in we're in bad spot. So yeah. What uh, what does the future look like? You know, 2050 is the date that you hear about a lot in agriculture that we're trying to uh, increase uh, production more with less by then. Um, if you had to look into a crystal ball, of course, you and I probably won't be around here then. But um, what do you think agriculture will be like in the year 2050? You know, it's uh, I had my I got three guys that are research associates that work here that have master's degrees and work with these faculty members and. We have the West Star Group come through here, here every year, and they'd asked us a couple years ago, said, what can you do on new technology? So I kind of laid that on my, my guys' a plate. I said, come up with a presentation on new technologies in agriculture. And anybody can do that. Just Google it. It's mind-boggling what's out there. What's going to be happening in the next five or ten years? Everything from, you know, stuff at the cellular level, which is way over my head, uh, you know, CRISPR technologies. And of course, all the gene editing and all the GMO stuff is already happening, but more of that's coming on. Uh, you know, harvesting technology where, you know, they can pick apples or something with a machine and determine if they're ripe. And, and all the, the GIS, GPS, I've heard y'all talk on some other podcasts you've had, you know, the, the farmer, uh, the, the auto steer on the tractors and the, you know, the, the the combine with the, you know, meeting up with the grain cart and the tractor without a driver in there. And there's all kinds of things that are happening and, uh, you know, and things we hadn't even thought about, I'm sure. And so it's, it's going to change. I mean, it's changed in my lifetime. My dad's 80 years old. You know, he grew up on that farm in Knoxville and they were plowing with mules and doing everything by hand and didn't have electricity when he was a kid. You know, he's seen a lot of stuff happen in his lifetime. I think we're going to probably see more than he did. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's cool. I mean, there's some neat stuff coming. You know, we a lot of a lot of new kids. You know, when you only have two percent of your population on the farm, most people don't know what that involves or what it's about. And so we're probably losing a lot of folks who, you know, they may not have the interest because they don't have the knowledge of, of what's out there. And I've seen the statistics. You probably have too. In the next. I forget how many years, you know, there's supposed to be 50 something thousand jobs in agriculture that we're not going to be able to fill because we're not going to have people trained to fill them. So I think the opportunities are going to be wide open. Um, And so if folks will go and get a little training and education and and some of them don't require that. Some of them are still going to be a a good job that you don't have to have college for. I think the tech schools are vitally important right now. Uh, You know, we got to have people that know how to build a center pivot, know how to wire that thing and know how to, you know, put all those controls in there. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunities for a lot of folks. Uh, I think it's important that people get training, whether that's college or technical training. And I, I tell people that, you know, we have a fair number of students come through, you know, get all you can get simply because in my case, for instance, it opened up doors for me that I hadn't even thought about. I never dreamed I'd want to be sitting here as the director of the Research and Education Center at Milan back when I was in school. That wasn't on my radar. But it's been a good run and a good ride, and, and I hope I can ride it on out for a few more years. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, the next few years are going to be exciting. And uh, I think it's a great a great area for people to look at. You don't have to have a farm background to go into agriculture. And uh, it's going to be neat to watch. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit with us today about agriculture and about what you guys are doing there uh, in Milan. And I encourage everybody to check out some of this stuff online. A lot of what you've talked about is going to be in our exhibit here um, at Discovery Park. And so uh, it's really exciting to get to talk to folks like you who are so passionate about the field of agriculture. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity and appreciate what you folks are doing up there to help us share the story and all the other good things. So keep up the good work. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.